welcome to Seen Through Glass and welcome to the D2, potentially my new favourite road in the south of France. I first came here early this year. I was doing a convoy down to Monaco with James, Mr. JWW, Paul from Supercars of London and Seb Delaney. And we kind of found this place by accident. Uh, we wanted to take a slightly more twisty and interesting road than the motorway. And thanks to some exploring on Google Maps, we stumbled across this place and my good Lord, I was blown away. Unfortunately, I wasn't actually filming that day, um, but we got to the bottom of the hill and I jumped out and I was like, oh God, I can't wait to see your footage, what a road. And they all looked at me blankly and went, oh no, we, we weren't filming either. So <laughs> at that point, I immediately marked the road on my map and vowed that I would come back here to try and capture it in all its epicness because I just think it is stunning. But you get a little bit of everything. It's got a, an element of Red Rock Road, the tunnels left, right and centre, tight and twisty, and then open, flowy bits where you can really get some nice speed up. And today, I've been doing exactly that because you may have noticed I am now finally in a manual Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio. If you've been following the Vlogari adventures, you will have seen that a couple of days ago I picked up one of these cars from Alfa Romeo in Turin, but 10 minutes down the road, it broke down. Uh, there was a quite significant issue actually with the battery, uh, which rendered it unavailable. Uh, and I was very kindly lent a 4C Spider instead. So I drove down to Monaco, and then late last night, the man from Alfa appeared with this red manual Giulia Quadrifoglio and said, it's time to swap. Uh, well, I thought that sounds like a pretty good idea because I have really been wanting to get my hands on a Giulia Quadrifoglio again for quite some time. It's been, in the back of my head, just damn, drive another Julia. I've been lucky and actually experienced the Alfa Romeo Giulia quite a few times already. I went to the initial launch event in Bolocco, the Alfa Romeo test track. I then had a diesel car for 10 days in the UK. And I also drove Tony's Quadrifoglio when he owned one earlier this year. So as I say, plenty of experiences in the Giulia. And to be completely transparent with you, I freaking love the things. Bar what happened earlier this week, every experience I've had with the Julia to date has been fantastic. But despite all the experiences, I've never actually had the chance to drive a six-speed manual quadrifolio like this one. The main reason being that in the UK and in the US, the range topper is only offered with an automatic eight-speed ZF gearbox. So I've always been intrigued. What would a 500 horsepower bi-turbo V6 Italian super saloon be like with a manual. As I say, I've been hooning up and down this beautiful D2 road all day and I finally got to grips with this manual gearbox because you do have to do that. You have to get to grips with it. It's not that straightforward. It's quite a I mean, this is a weird thing to say. It's quite a manly gearbox and I'm not particularly manly but you have to really grab it and manhandle it and you can't be all delicate with it and that is quite rewarding because you feel like you're really driving and you're really thrashing this thing around but it's also not that comfortable at the beginning it takes you a while to kind of get used to the positions of the gears and making it nice and smooth but then once you get on top of it it's it's so weird because this is a big car this is a big car you know i don't spend a lot of time in saloons driving saloons or anything really bigger than sort of coupés. Ah, oh, so I was, there you go, see, I still haven't got used to it completely. I was a little concerned that I think this is too big, but with the manual gearbox, it feels like you're driving a Lotus. And that's a big thing to do with how fantastic the Julia platform is. The seating position is just excellent. You're so low. The pedals, the steering wheel, everything is where you want it to be. You've got great visibility, except this pillar here sometimes get in your way going around the left hand corner but in general it just feels inherently sporty and then you've got all of the control in your right hand and your left foot it's yeah a very very different experience not quite what I was expecting and if I was really put if someone put a gun to my head and said pick one I'd probably still choose the automatic because 
it is just a fantastic gearbox, the automatic, and I think you're going to be quicker. This is fun, this is fun, but I think you're going to be quicker, and you're going to get those massive, massive paddles. The power delivery is quite bizarre, because it doesn't really feel like a turbo car until really like the last one and a half, two thousand RPM, when this power comes out of nowhere. You already think you're going quick. You're like, oh yeah, this car's so quick, I'd forgotten. And then it just takes on another level. The thing is, if you're considering one of these cars, you're probably considering an M3, because it is a direct rival. But on paper and behind the wheel, it's so much quicker, I think. I mean, so much quicker is probably an overstatement, getting a little carried away, but it's definitely quicker. And I just think it's a more, a more exciting experience. Fair play, the M3 has its audience and they've improved it year on year and Paul absolutely loves his on Supercars of London. But it's still never done it for me. Even with the competition pack and etc, etc, it's still never done it for me. And that could just be the type of car that it is. But this Julia does really excite me. As a daily, what an absolute tool. I'm not convinced I like the sound. I mean, that is because it's a bi-turbo V6. But still... And also, something slightly annoying with the Quadrifoglio in general is that the valves only open at around 4,000 RPM, so you've got to be going pretty quick to make it a bit shouty. Or, you can have the valves always on if you're in race mode. But in race mode, there's no traction control. And 500 horsepower to the rear wheels is it's quite a lot. This car does like to slip and slide around quite a bit. So it's a weird compromise, that. And I hate to sound like Paul, but it needs an Armatrix exhaust. <laughs> but I think it does, because I just it would, it would take this car onto another level, I think. I understand that the people who are gonna own it want it for everyday use as well. So they wanna be able to sort of cruise around quietly. But I think when you're on it like this, just want a little bit more noise. Maybe it's just more noise in the cabin because it does sound great from the outside. But yeah, look at this. I'm just flowing along this road, talking to you guys and having so much fun. And it feels so composed. It's not Larry. Whilst yes, you know, it can step out on you when you force it to. It's, it's just, it's a sports car. It's honestly, it's a sports car, not a sports saloon. And it's amazing they've been able to do that. And the manual is just, you know, it's been perfect for today. As I say, I think I would like, if I was to own this car, which you know what, I would honestly consider owning this car. It's a little bit too expensive for me right now considering my current garage plans. But if this was 45 grand on the used market, not 55, oh my God, I think I'd be hard kept to not run down to the bank, try and borrow some more money and go buy one. performance of the Quadrifoglio, it does all the tasks that you'd want it to do as a super saloon. It's got a decent sized boot, and whilst I think the design of the rear seats look a bit unimaginative, there's plenty of room for passengers back there. The infotainment system again doesn't look too nice, but it does what you need it to do, and if you're buying a car solely based on the infotainment system, I think you're probably buying it for the wrong reasons. The car also has a super eco mode, where the engine operates with half the cylinders for extra fuel economy, so it's a pretty good cruiser too. Oh, the brakes as well, the brakes are great. Really, I've been relying on them quite a bit today because when you're on a tight, twisty road, sometimes you get caught out by a corner that comes up on you a bit too quick, and the brakes have just been excellent. I will be very sad to hand the keys back to this car, I really, really will. And I'm sad that I've only had it for such a short time in the end. Great that I got to hang out with the 4C Spider again, but it's just so special. Honestly, if you've never driven a Julia at any level, petrol, diesel, quadrifoglio, go and have a go because it's just fun. You'll have a laugh. You'll have a laugh. Oh, tunnel. <laughs> there you go. Couldn't find a gear. That's what I mean. Like, it's not the most straightforward of gearboxes. It doesn't, it doesn't complement you. 
Um, and you know, that just could be because I'm sat on the wrong side and shifting with the wrong hand, but it's not, you know, even when I picked up the car from Alpha, they said, you know, the gearbox is a little bit brutal. Takes no prisoners, is that right? Takes no prisoners. Another ton and I look, let's put it into race. See if we can get a bit more. <laughs> it's got that little like farty element. But yeah, anyway, look guys, I hope you've enjoyed it. I've been banging on enough now uh, about this car. Um, I'm so glad I got to show you the D2. Uh, give it a thumbs up if you've enjoyed the video and make sure to subscribe for plenty more videos to come.